dot org. The Fur Country by Jules Verne, Part Two, Chapter Three, A Tour of the Island. From that day, July eighteenth, it was decided that the bearings should be taken as on board a vessel whenever the state of the atmosphere rendered the operation possible. Was not the island, in fact, a disabled ship, tossed about without sails or helm? The next day, after taking the bearings, Hobson announced that, without change of latitude, the island had advanced several miles further west. McNab was ordered to commence the construction of a huge boat. Hobson telling him, in explanation, that he proposed making a reconnaissance of the coast as far as Russian American next summer. The carpenter asked no further questions, but proceeded to choose his wood, and fixed upon the beach at the foot of Cape Bathurst as his dockyard, so that he might easily be able to launch his vessel. Hobson intended to set out the same day on his excursion round the island, in which he and his comrades were imprisoned. Many changes might take place in the configuration of this sheet of ice. Subject as it was to the influence of the variable temperature of the waves, and it was important to determine its actual form at the present time, its area and its thickness in different parts. The point of rupture, which was most likely at the isthmus itself, ought to be examined with special care. The fracture being still fresh, it might be possible to ascertain the exact arrangement. Of the stratified layers of ice and earth of which the soil of the island was composed, but in the afternoon the sky clouded over suddenly, and a violent squall, accompanied with thick mists, swept down upon the fort. Presently, torrents of rain fell, and large hailstones rattled on the roof, whilst a few distant claps of thunder were heard—a phenomenon of exceedingly rare occurrence in such elevated latitudes. Hobson was obliged to put off his trip, and wait until the fury of the elements abated. But during the twentieth, twenty-first, and twenty-second July, no change occurred. The storm raged, the floods of heaven were let loose, and the waves broke upon the beach with a deafening roar. Liquid avalanches were flung with such force upon Cape Bathurst that there was reason to dread that it might give way. Its stability was, in fact. Somewhat problematical, as it consisted merely of an aggregation of sand and earth, without any firm foundation. Vessels at sea might well be pitied in this fearful gale, but the floating island was of too vast a bulk to be affected by the agitation of the waves, and remained indifferent to their fury. During the night of the twenty-second July, the tempest suddenly ceased. A strong breeze from the northeast dispelled the last mists upon the horizon. The barometer rose a few degrees, and the weather appeared likely to favor Hobson's expedition. He was to be accompanied by Mrs. Barnett and Sergeant Long, and expected to be absent a day or two. The little party took some salt meat, biscuits, and a few flasks of rum with them. And there was nothing in their excursion to surprise the rest of the colonists. The days were just then very long, the sun only disappearing below the horizon for a few hours. There were no wild animals to be feared now. The bears seemed to have fled by instinct from the peninsula, whilst it was still connected with the mainland. But to neglect no precaution, each of the three explorers was provided with a gun. The lieutenant and his subordinate also carried hatches and ice chisels, which a traveller in the polar regions should never be without. During the absence of the lieutenant and the sergeant, the command of the fort fell to Corporal Jolif, or rather to his little wife, and Hobson knew that he could trust her. Thomas Black could not be depended on; he would not even join the exploring party. He promised, however, to watch the northern latitudes very carefully, and to note any change which should take place in the sea or the position of the cape during the absence of the lieutenant. Mrs. Barnett had endeavored to reason with the unfortunate astronomer, but he would listen to nothing. He felt that nature had deceived him, and that he could never forgive her.
After many a hearty farewell, the lieutenant and his two companions left the fort by the postern gate, and, turning to the west, followed the lengthened curve of the coast between Capes Bathurst and Eskimo. It was eight o'clock in the morning. The oblique rays of the sun struck upon the beach, and it touched with many a brilliant tint. The angry billows of the sea were sinking to rest, and the birds, ptarmigans, guillemots, puffins, and petrels, driven away by the storm, were returning by thousands. Troops of ducks were hastening back to Lake Barnett, flying close, although they knew it not, to Mrs. Jolliffe's saucepan. Polar hares, martens, muskrats, and earmines rose before the travellers and fled at their approach. but not with any great appearance of haste or terror. The animals evidently felt drawn towards their old enemies by a common danger. They know well enough that they are hemmed in by the sea and cannot quit the island, observed Hobson. They are all in the habit of seeking warmer climates in the south in the winter, are they not? inquired Mrs. Barnett. Yes, madam, but unless they are presently able to cross the ice field, they will have to remain prisoners like ourselves, and I am afraid the great number will die of cold or hunger. I hope they will be good enough to supply us with food for a long time, observed the sergeant, and I think it is very fortunate that they had not the sense to run away before the rupture of the isthmus. The birds will, however, leave us, added Mrs. Barnett. Oh, yes, madam. Everything with wings will go. They can traverse long distances without fatigue. And, more fortunate than ourselves, they will regain terra firma. Can we not use them as messengers? asked Mrs. Barnett. A good idea, madam, a capital idea, said Hobson. We might easily catch some hundreds of these birds and tie a paper round their necks with our exact situation written upon it. John Ross, in 1848, tried similar means to acquaint the survivors of the Franklin expedition with the presence of his ships, the enterprise, and the investigator in the polar seas. He caught some hundreds of white foxes in traps, riveted a copper collar round the neck of each, with all the necessary information engraved upon it, and then set them free in every direction. Perhaps some of the messengers may have fallen into the hands of the shipwrecked wanderers. Perhaps so, replied Hobson. I know that an old fox was taken by Captain Hatteras during his voyage of discovery, wearing a collar half worn away and hidden beneath his thick white fur. What we cannot do with the quadrupeds, we will do with the birds. Chatting thus and laying plans for the future, The three explorers continued to follow the coast. They noticed no change. The abrupt cliffs, covered with earth and sand, showed no signs of a recent alteration in the extent of the island. It was, however, to be feared that the vast sheet of ice would be worn away at the base by the action of the warm currents, and on this point Hobson was naturally anxious. By eleven o'clock in the morning, The eight miles between Capes Bathurst and Eskimo had been traversed. A few traces of the encampment of Kalumaha's party still remained. Of course, the snow huts had entirely disappeared, but some cinders and walrus bones marked the spot. The three explorers halted here for a short time. They intended to pass the few short hours of the night at Walrus's Bay. Which they hoped to reach in a few hours. They breakfasted, seated on a slightly rising ground, covered with a scanty and stunted herbage. Before their eyes lay the ocean, bounded by a clearly defined sea horizon, without a sail or an iceberg to break the monotony of the vast expanse of water. Should you be very much surprised if some vessel came in sight now, Lieutenant? inquired Mrs. Barnett. I should be very agreeably surprised, madam, replied Hobson. It is not at all uncommon for whalers to come as far north as this, especially now that the Arctic Ocean is frequented by whales and c h a c o l a t s But you must remember that it is the twenty third July, 
and the summer is far advanced. The whole fleet of whaling vessels is probably now in Gulf Katsubi, at the entrance to the strait. Whalers shun the sudden changes in the Arctic Ocean, and with good reason. They dread being shut in the ice, and the icebergs, avalanches, and ice fields they avoid are very fine things for which we earnestly pray. They will come, Lieutenant, said Long. Have patience in another two months. The waves will no longer break upon the shores of Cape Eskimo. Cape Eskimo, observed Mrs. Barnett with a smile. That name, like those we gave to the other parts of the peninsula, may turn out unfortunate too. We have lost Port Barnett and Paulina River. Who can tell whether Cape Eskimo and Walrus's Bay may not also disappear in time? They too will disappear, madam. Replied Hobson, and after them the whole of Victoria Island, for nothing now connects it with a continent, and it is doomed to destruction. The result is inevitable, and our choice of geographical names will be thrown away. But fortunately, the Royal Society has not yet adopted them, and Sir Roderick Murchison will have nothing to efface on his maps. One name he will exclaimed the sergeant, which. Inquired Hobson, "Cape Bathurst," replied Long. "Ah, yes, you are right. Cape Bathurst must now be removed from maps of the polar regions." Two hours' rest were all the explorers cared for, and at one o'clock they prepared to resume their journey. Before starting, Hobson once more looked round him from the summit of Cape Eskimo, but seeing nothing worthy of notice. He rejoined Mrs. Barnett and Sergeant Long. Madam, he said, addressing the lady, you have not forgotten the family of natives we met here last winter. Oh no, I have always held dear little Kalumaha in friendly remembrance. She promised to come and see us again at Fort Hope, but she will not be able to do so. But why do you ask me about the natives now? Because I remember something to which, much to my regret, I did not at the time attach sufficient importance. What was that? You remember the uneasy surprise the men manifested at finding a big factory at the foot of Cape Bathurst. Oh yes, perfectly. You remember that I tried to make out what the natives meant, and that I could not do so. Yes, I remember. Well, added Hobson, I know why they shook their heads. From tradition, experience, or something, the Eskimo knew what the peninsula really was. They knew we had not built on firm ground, but as things had probably remained as they were for centuries, they thought there was no immediate danger, and that it was not worth while to explain themselves. Very likely, you are right," replied Mrs. Barnett. But I feel sure that Kalumaha had no suspicion of her companion's fears, or she would have warned us. Hobson quite agreed with Mrs. Barnett, and Sergeant Long observed, "It really seems to have been by a kind of fatality that we settled ourselves upon this peninsula, just before it was torn away from the mainland. I suppose, Lieutenant, that it had been connected for a very long time, perhaps for centuries." You might say for thousands and thousands of years, Sergeant," replied Hobson. "Remember that soil on which we are treading has been brought here by wind, little by little. That the sand has accumulated grain by grain. Think of the time it must have taken for the seeds of firs, willows, and arbutus to become shrubs and trees. Perhaps the sheet of ice on which we float was welded to the continent before the creation of man." Well," cried Long, "it really might have waited a few centuries longer before it drifted. How much anxiety and how many dangers we might then have been spared!" Sergeant Long's most sensible remark closed the conversation, and the journey was resumed. From Cape Eskimo to Walrus's Bay, the coast ran almost due south, following the one hundred and twenty-seventh meridian. Looking behind them, they could see one corner of the lagoon, its waters sparkling in the sunbeams, and a little beyond the wooded heights in which it was framed. Large eagles soared above their heads.
their cries and the loud flapping of their wings, breaking the stillness, and furred animals of many kinds, martens, polecats, ermines, etc., crouching behind some rising ground, or hiding amongst the stunted bushes and willows, gazed inquiringly at the intruders. They seemed to understand that they had nothing to fear. Hobson caught a glimpse of a few beavers wandering about, evidently ill at ease, and puzzled at the disappearance of the little river, with no ledges to shelter them, and no stream by which to build a new home. They were doomed to die of cold when the severe frost set in. Sergeant Long also saw a troop of wolves crossing the plain. It was evident that specimens of the whole Arctic fauna were imprisoned on the island, and there was every reason to fear that when famished with hunger, all the carnivorous beasts would be formidable enemies to the occupants of Fort Hope. Fortunately, however, one race of animals appeared to be quite unrepresented. Not a single white bear was seen. Once the sergeant thought he saw an enormous white mass moving about on the other side of a clump of willows, but on close examination decided that he was mistaken. The coast near Walrus's Bay was, on the whole, only slightly elevated above the sea level, and in the distance the waves broke into running foam as they do upon a sloping beach. It was to be feared that the soil had little stability, but there was no means of judging of the modifications which had taken place since their last visit, and Hobson much regretted that he had not made benchmarks upon Cape Bathurst before he left, that he might judge of the amount of sinking or depression which took place. He determined, however, to take this precaution on his return. It will be understood that, under the circumstances, the party did not advance very rapidly. A pause was often made to examine the soil, or to see if there were any sign of an approaching fracture on the coast, and sometimes the explorers wandered inland for half a mile. Here and there the sergeant planted branches of willow or birch to serve as landmarks for the future, especially wherever undermining seemed to be going on rapidly and the solidity of the ground was doubtful. By this means it would be easy to ascertain the changes which might take place. They did advance, however, and at three o'clock in the afternoon they were only three miles from Walrus's Bay, and Hobson called Mrs. Barnett's attention to the important changes which had been effected by the rupture of the isthmus. Formerly, the southwestern horizon was shut in by a long, slightly curved coastline, formed by the shores of Liverpool Bay. Now a sea line bounded the view, the continent having disappeared. Victoria Island ended in an abrupt angle where it had broken off, and all felt sure that on turning round that angle the ocean would be spread out before them, and that its waves would bathe the whole of the southern side of the island which was once the connecting link between Walrus's Bay and Washburn Bay. Mrs. Barnett could not look at the changed aspect of the scene without emotion. She had expected it, and yet her heart beat almost audibly. She gazed across the sea for the missing continent, which was now left several hundred miles behind, and it rushed upon her mind with a fresh stock, that she would never set foot on America again. Her agitation was indeed excusable, and it was shared by the lieutenant and the sergeant. All quickening their steps, eager to reach the abrupt angle in the south, the ground rose slightly as they advanced, and the layers of earth and sand became thicker. This, of course, was explained by the former proximity of this part of the coast to the true continent. The thickness of the crust of ice, and of the layer of earth at the point of junction, increasing, as it probably did, every century, explained the long resistance of the isthmus, which nothing but some extraordinary convulsion could have overcome. Such a convulsion was the earthquake 
of the 8th January, which, although it had only affected the continent of North America, had sufficed to break the connecting link, and to launch Victoria Island upon the wide ocean. At four o'clock p.m., the angle was reached. Walrus's Bay, formed by an indentation of the firm ground, had disappeared. It had remained behind with the continent. "'By my faith, madam,' explained the sergeant, "'it's lucky for you we didn't call it Paulina Barnett Bay.' "'Yes,' replied the lady. "'I begin to think I am an unlucky godmother for newly discovered places.'" End of chapter 3